Please welcome from Calgary, Judy Johnson. Thank you, Lauren, for that wonderful introduction. That's very warm, very articulate, um, lovely. And thank you, uh, Centre for Inquiry, for inviting me to talk about a topic that I love. And I dare not be dogmatic about dogmatism. I mean, you couldn't iron the wrinkles out of that irony. <laughs> well, when I first learned about CFI's mission, which is to foster a secular society based on science, reason, freedom of inquiry, and humanistic values, I thought, now here is everything I value and support, and everything dogmatic people devalue and oppose. So I was delighted to learn there is such an agency, and I'm really happy to be here. It's good to know that you, and hopefully myself, are eagerly, eagerly trying to open our minds, our own minds, about those that are closed. So why is it, do you think, that some people's minds are like the bed in their guest room? Always made up, seldom used. <laughs> and how do we know if someone is just being opinionated versus being dogmatic? Well, these are the questions I asked throughout my studies in graduate school. And uh, both my thesis in the master's level and my doctoral dissertation focused on the measurement of dogmatism. And it was only after that that I began to inquire about a theory. Hopefully, there was a comprehensive theory out there that gave a little more explanation about the features of dogmatism and its developmental origins. And there was nothing forthcoming, so I decided, having studied the area, um, that I would develop my own theory and my own taxonomy of features, which I did then in my book, which Lauren talked about. So it all began with a serendipitous find in a secondhand bookstore. Years ago, I stumbled upon Milton Rokic's book, The Open and Closed Mind, and I was so fascinated by it. Uh, and to this day, many years later, uh, I continue to think a lot about dogmatism, my own tendencies too, because all of us sometimes have a tendency, especially if we're a little anxious or um, feeling a bit emotionally attached to an idea, we have a tendency to narrow our thinking a bit. So um, I, my theory, it draws from a number of disciplines in the field, mainly psychology, but personality theory, uh, evolutionary psychology, neuroscience, social psychology, cognitive psychology, anthropology, biopsychology. But, uh, but it needs, despite the research that I've put into the, the ideas behind it, my theory really needs empirical validation. As it stands, I think it's simply a reasonable theory at this time. So we've all known people who are commonly described as, as pig-headed or hidebound, or rednecks who never met a bigot they don't like. And, and these people, they act as if they're the sole expert on a topic, or every topic. And they simply um, refuse to see things any other way because in their minds, they have nailed truth to the mat. As Churchill said, they won't change their minds and they won't change the topic. Well, there are degrees of dogmatism and the mildest form is the adamant voice of I'm right, you're wrong. A more moderate variation is I'm right, you're stupid. But extreme dogmatism, this is where the danger lies, extreme dogmatism is the voice that rages, I'm right, you're dead. So let's look at some definitions now, and these are borrowed from Oxford and Webster. I didn't go into the details of um, referencing every one of those particular quotes. I'll let you read this on your own, just to get a feel for the dictionary definition. <laughs> 
So over time, and with repetition, myths and narratives become the dogma of belief systems, which if they are then widespread and institutionalized, become known as ideo ideological systems, uh, about which people can be very passionate. So ideology, to quote E.O. Wilson, is simply dogma writ large. And my definition has been fine-tuned over the years, and it attempts to capture the entire suite of dogmatism's psychological features, and I'll let you read that slowly on your own. So you'll see that I've emphasized their personality trait. And that, that is to emphasize, emphasize that dogmatism is a pattern of behaviors that endure across time and across different situations. And as trait theorists note, um, traits anchor an upper and a lower end of a continuum on a measure of a particular trait. So because they're, they're fairly stable across time and situation, we are not, for example, extroverted on Monday and introverted on Wednesday, any more than we're likely to be open-minded on Tuesday and closed-minded on, thir on Thursday. So the research into trait stability, uh, which is done largely by Costa and McRae, if there are any psychologists who have studied uh, trait theory, others as well, of course, but they suggest that trait stability um, pretty much is in place at the age of 30. And so if we're really dogmatic and think now of how dogmatism anchors more the extreme end of a scale, if we're dogmatic at 35, it's very difficult to jump out of our cognitive ruts. And someone asked me last year, I was giving a talk in Cambridge, and uh, they asked me, but, and he was quite fervent about this, but shouldn't we be dogmatic about some things? Now that, good questions are always the most difficult to answer. And that is a very good question. It gets at the nitty gritty of my own struggle with dogmatism. Are there times? And I say, yes, we should be passionate about certain ideas and beliefs. Dogmatic, no. And you'll get a sense of why I say no to dogmatism on everything as we go through this. But passionate, open-minded believers have reasoned beliefs with flexible boundaries. They have liberal um, beliefs, more unconventional attitudes. They're insightful, they're more imaginative, have a curious mind, and they can tolerate differences. They're all of you. Dogmatism is, of course, a very different matter. So, I want to look very briefly, and this will be briefly, at this, the, the innate childhood needs that Rokich and I have added to this, uh, assume that all humans have. And Rokich started off with these two, a need to defend against anxiety and a need to know. And he maintained that we are all born with an innate need to know ourselves, others, and the world around us. But we're also born with a need to defend against anxiety because we're small and we're helpless and we're inexperienced. We haven't developed intellectually. And the extent to which we need to defend against anxiety prevails, the more the need to know becomes constricted and compromised. Rokic wrote about that in 1960. I stumbled upon his book in the mid-70s, found that there still really wasn't much done on dogmatism other than, what used his, other than people who used his measurement scale to test various aspects of it. But there was no theory about it. And I began to think, well, this is very good. Uh, the need to know and the need to defend against anxiety, it's very simple, it's very to the point, it's also very Freudian. And in Rokic's book, he only spent two or three paragraphs defining dogmatism as a Freudian defense mechanism. 
which at the time made sense because Freud was still, you know, a towering um, giant in terms of psychological theory. But I, I decided to add an innate need for social connection um, as a third need uh, upon which the need for dignity depends. So I see dogmatism as a mistaken solution to unfulfilled needs. And I'll have more to say about the psychological and social, cultural, systemic influences that jeopardize these needs. But first, let's consider its subtraits. Um, this is arbitrary. I've thought about this and changed it a lot. And it's a work in process. You can feel free to add to it. Write to my dog on, blog on dog at dogmatism.ca. Give me your ideas. I've come up with 13, uh, 13 subtraits or features or characteristics of dogmatism, five of which are cognitive, three emotional, five behavioral, and I've assumed that six are necessary to determine trait presence. So you'll be familiar now with, with quite a few of these, but up until now they've sort of hung together loosely. So let's begin with the cognitive features. The first one is an intolerance of ambiguity. So there's an example there. This is Budner's definition, the persistent tendency to perceive ambiguous information in situations as sources of threat. So an example of a comment that we might see there. How all of us cope with ambiguity um, affects our perceptions, affects our interpretations of events and situations, but it also um, influences the extent to which we value cognitive effort. To cope with threatening uncertainty, dogmatic people rigidly cling to absolute truth because it removes ambiguity and it reduces anxiety. Ambiguity intensifies anxiety, which is, which is the engine of dogmatism. And fear puts it in overdrive. The next feature is defensive cognitive closure, which is a consequence of an intolerance of anxiety. When new ideas threaten their existing truths, dogmatic people, what they tend to do is manage the discomfort by immediately judging and dismissing anything that conflicts with those truths. It's patently ridiculous or just flat wrong. And it isn't that they, that they um, have psychological or cognitive inertia or that they can't do the serious work of thinking. That, that is not why I think they close their minds. They close their minds prematurely to remove ambiguity, to reduce anxiety, and to convince others that they are right, indisputably right. So all three of those reinforce their egos, their safety, and their certainty, which brings us to the third cognitive trait, rigid certainty. This is from Bob Altemeyer's book. Um, in which the, um, if you can see it there, The Authoritarian Spectre, it's a wonderful book. He's a prophet at University of Manitoba. His work is published by, um, by Harvard. And John Yost of New York University, uh, if any of you are from New York, John and I did a, a PBS interview on the radio station, and John is working on intolerance of ambiguity and political orientation. He's doing some fascinating work. Those are John Jost and or Yost um, and Bob Altemeyer are two of the leading figures in this area. Um, the litmus test for rigid certainty is the answer to this question, and you could try asking someone this if you think they're really dogmatic about an issue. What kind of evidence would it take for you to change your mind? I think we know what their answers like to be if they're really dogmatic, because rarely will they acknowledge that they're mistaken. 
even when they're presented with convincing uh, contradictory evidence that would give reasonable people pause. Abandoning their rigid certainty means that they'd have to tolerate ambiguity and they'd have to open their minds to the possibility that they might be wrong. And that threatens too much need. The need to be absolutely, unequivocally, indubitably right. And the need to be respected for being right. Next trait, compartmentalization. Well, you can see the ridiculousness of this, right? But dogmatic people don't seem to get it. They, they partition contradictory beliefs in isolated chambers in their mind with no connecting corridors because that protects them from the conflict of knowing that they simultaneously hold contradictory, logically contradictory beliefs. A very primitive way to prevent what psychologists, and I'm sure probably all of you have heard, cognitive dissonance. Others uh, call it hypocrisy. Now, I may... This is one audience where I'm probably not stepping on anyone's toes here, but I want you to consider the Catholic Church. You see? <laughs> now, this is very interesting. <laughs> when I was in Cambridge last year, in England, I mentioned this. There was no laughter. <laughs> and, I, and I wondered about that. But I kept going, and someone said afterwards, you know, what do you think people thought? I said, I would, I would use this example in a cathedral of Catholics. Because I think this is compartmentalization. Here we have the Catholic Church teaching love and charity, and yet it denies birth control to the fastest growing, poorest nations, subjecting them to incredible poverty, starvation, homelessness, poor education, poor health care. To borrow a line from Christopher Hitchens, is there any known language in which this can make sense? I love that line. A lack of personal insight is the last uh, cognitive characteristics. And the difficulty here is that dogmatic people can't distance themselves far enough from their emotions and their core beliefs to recognize their own closed-minded rigidity. And it's even more difficult to consider for them the psychological and social forces that push them in dogmatic directions. Close encounters with their own closed minds are too close for comfort. Consider someone, you may be already doing this, someone you know who you think is pretty narrow-minded, maybe even dogmatic. And can you imagine him or her saying to you something like this, maybe after a couple of beers, I am Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> so they say to you, you know, I really am pretty narrow-minded and rigid. One of these days, I should ask myself what I'm so afraid of. <laughs> maybe there's a lot wrong, or maybe there's nothing wrong with being absolutely wrong. And maybe there's nothing so right about being absolutely right. And why do I get so upset when people won't admit they're wrong and I'm right? Maybe there's a lot wrong with being absolutely right. And maybe it's not too late to teach this old dogmatist new tricks. Again, <laughs> thank you. There's a corollary of this feature, which is a narrow appreciation of art. And there's 
it's empirical support. It's fairly soft, uh, I think fairly weak empirical support. I think it would be interesting to try to replicate this. For the hypothesis that dogmatic people prefer symmetric, concrete kinds of paintings over abstract art. Any five-year-old can do better than that. Because abstract art is too ambiguous. And I wonder, you know, would they also prefer poems that rhyme? You know, versus philosophic odes or sonnets. Maybe they'd prefer music with simple chromatic chords. <coughs> patriotic marches. <laughs> Belief-associated anxiety and fear is the first of the emotional characteristics of dogmatism, of which I've said one is necessary, and there are three of them. All thinking occurs within the domain of emotions. And yet we're often una we're unaware of the emotions that sort of hum in the background. And it's only within the last 25 years or so that psychologists have closely examined the impact of emotions on reason. And they've concluded that when we're anxious or fearful or angry, we're dumber. And that's because strong emotions, or what Joseph Ledoux calls low road emotions, they bombard the amygdala, which is a midbrain structure that largely governs emotions. And that bombardment blocks higher cognitive processing, more analytic processing. And at that point, we simply have a difficult time putting things together. So persistent anxiety, or fear, or anger, they make it difficult for the cognitive brain to manage the emotional brain. And we can't then reason effectively. Which explains probably why when we're emotionally upset, it's just easier to believe that what we feel is right, is right. And that makes us very vulnerable to believing what we want to believe, or what others want us to believe not what we ought to believe based on logic and reason. Ironically, although dogmatists can't tolerate anxiety and doubt within themselves, those in positions of power try to instill fear and anxiety in others because fear weakens the credibility of facts and scientific evidence that would compel us to change our beliefs and our behaviors. And I have here the example of dogmat the dogmatism of free market fundamentalism that motivates think tanks to fuel anxiety and fear, especially about the dangers of government regulations or increased taxes. Increased taxes? No. That's government theft. It destroys initiative. It destroys jobs. And that kind of fear gets votes. Belief-associated anger at the individual level. You know, anger for many people is a safe place to hide. And, and dogmatic people may convert their anxiety to anger in order to conceal the very emotion that generated it. They, they mistakenly assume that dictatorial bravado will mask their anxiety and somehow bolster their identity as someone who really knows what they're talking about. Discussions for them are perceived as fights with winners and losers, and those who differ with them, note the word differ, I think it's a nicer word than disagree. Those who differ with them are fierce opponents who they need to defeat. Sarah Palin said it all. Don't retreat, reload. Heard that. Well, fortunately, most dogmatic people are not dangerously aggressive. So in many cases, as philosopher John Austin said, it might be better to just let sleeping dogmatists lie. <laughs> I say unless they're roused by a pack of Rottweilers. <laughs> in which case, let's hope they don't have pups. Existential despair, 
If the world of heroes and ideological truth falters, people with this subtrait lose their balance. And they, they become cynical, perhaps disillusioned, pessimistic. They live in what John Bunyan calls a slew of despond. And they despair at their inability to control events that would otherwise keep their lives ordered and predictable. They also tend to lack courage to risk the unknown. So let's now look at the behavior features of dogmatism. A preoccupation with power and status, it's natural for us to notice status symbols, but the, dog, the dogmatist is hypervigilant for signs of power and status. So when they're introduced to others, they quickly want to know, you know, what's their ethnic background, their occupation, their place of residence, and so on, because it enables them to pigeonhole them in black and white categories that reduces ambiguity. So that's why these stereotypes work. And those with power and status leave them feeling awestruck and ingratiating, easily intimidated. They're the powerful and the wealthy. They're the virtuous, they're the deserving. Whereas the less privileged are unworthy because they lack proper morals, intelligence, they lack self-discipline. Notice how categorical and judgmental that is. Glorification of the in-group, vilification of the out, you've heard of this. These are derivative of a preoccupation with power and status, and it's the ethnocentric us against them, kind of a fortress mentality that's seen in, in idolatry and hero worship and villainy and prejudice, discrimination. Sheldon Kopp, this is going back quite a few years now, he's a Buddhist monk who said, if you have a hero, look again. You have diminished yourself in some way. There are no heroes and there are no saints. We are all tragically flawed. There are heroic deeds, but there are no heroes. I thought that was a rather interesting um, way of looking at how we tend to glorify others. It's also glorification. It's manifest in fervent, fervent patriotism that turns a blind eye to violations of human rights and laws. And it's seen in people who arbitrarily judge ideas according to the status of the messenger, not according to message content. Dogmatic authoritarian aggression, this operates more at the institutional level. I actually heard a fellow say this uh, not too long ago. Um, authoritarian here, it's a feature of dogmatism, and there's abundant a good you know, peer-reviewed research that concludes authoritarians view the world as a dangerous, fearful place, a consequence of what George Lakoff calls being raised in the strict parent family, where uh, parents demand respect, um, unquestioning obedience, strict adherence to conventional um, rules of behavior and family values, and, and strict self-discipline. And these parents control their children with harsh punishment. So is it any wonder that many of them grow up to be very condescending and mean-spirited toward people they judge inferior? And those who gain power, political, religious, or corporate power, they feel entitled to make their own rules, which they, which they um, impose without any mercy. And they also feel at liberty to break the laws that the rest of us must follow. They are the self-righteous moralists who obey a higher authority that, according to their twisted logic, legitimizes their violence and their violations of human rights and laws that are set down by the International Criminal Court, United Nations, the Geneva Conventions, and so on. So while their explicit goal may be to bring democracy to the world or to save lost souls, their implicit goal is to gain power in order to strengthen and preserve their identity or achieve what psychiatrist um, Robert J. Lifton calls revolutionary immortality. <laughs> 
Um, an example of this is Kim Il-sung, who declared himself the eternal president of North Korea. Dogmatic authoritarian submission. Um, submitters, uh, whose identities are largely externally authored, tend to be preoccupied with power and status, and they tend to glorify authority figures. So it's understandable that they will willingly follow orders to aggress against others because they're attracted to the bold certainty of aggressors who they perceive as somehow offering them safety and identity, social belonging. You're part of the group, like a cult. Now you have, <clears throat> excuse me, not only identity, but you have dignity. You can imagine how crushed they would feel if the cult or the movement that they're part of suddenly um, disbands. That's when the existential despair hits, and probably hits pretty hard. So the submitters reinforce aggressors' demands for respect and obedience, and both of them then are enmeshed in, in um, reciproc reciprocally rewarding kind of interdependent roles. They're, they're codependent. And we see this in dysfunctional marriages, where partners stay together because they have complementary traits of aggression and submission. They need each other. They need each other. I think that's why they stay. Arrogant, dismissive communication is the last. Have a look at these. Have you ever heard people preface their statements with something like this? That last one, right. Of course I'm right. What's the matter with you? I think that's pretty much guaranteed to prevent you getting a second dinner invitation. Because in, in the dogmatic mind, though, let's try to understand, they're not really attacking you as much as they are saying, I need you to listen to me and respect me, because I know what I'm talking about. You don't have a clue. And these prefaces are not for the captive audience that hears them. They're for the captive mind that utters them. Um, or pronounces them, I should say. It's a mind that communicates deeper needs to those who are more psychologically attuned. And people with this trait use what I like to call, somebody else called this, I don't know who to um, give credit to, but the shoot and reload style of communication. They dominate the conversation, and when others finally get a word in edgewise, they're not listening. They're reloading. So they can shoot down the next opposing view. And they, they fail to see that, as with all of us, we're, we always, every day in our interpersonal communications, we teach others how to treat us. And the dogmatic person fails to see that he or she is also teaching people how to treat them um, by, by facial expressions, uh, by the finger, as we've all seen this, or the jab or the wag, or how about the traffic cops hold it? You've got to remember that. Um, and also, they, you know, and they, they call people idiots, for example. That's an ad hominem attack against the entire person, not against the idea. But once they do that, they can then discredit everything the person says in their mind. But they're not aware, I don't think, of the internal need to do that and the processes that it involves. So that's the uh, last of the cognitive. And here's a summary of the 13 characteristics, just, just so that you can review them on your own. And again, you need. I've suggested you need six out of the 13 to determine that the trait is present. So in the final analysis, that'd be psychological analysis, dogmatism, it's not about the superiority of one belief system over another, and it's not about the superiority of one leader over another, and it's not about ideology. What is it about? It is about identity. 
fragile, bitter, or brittle identity that is externally authored, disproportionately so. It's, um, it's about how people hold and communicate their beliefs, not what they believe. So content is secondary to style, which means that very bright people are not immune to dogmatism, and post-secondary degrees don't inoculate against it, although I think we can assume that intelligence and advanced degrees offer some protection. I think probably many of you have known scholars who stifle creative inquiry because they're afraid that collaboration of ideas will fertilize a cross-section of ideas that might threaten their own. Have you ever heard this saying? I think it's Richard Feynman, I've, uh, who I've seen two people given um, being attributed for this quote, Feynman and uh, Francis Fukuyama. Science progresses one funeral at a time. So we have 10 minutes left. Let's go very quickly through a proposed theory of causation. In 2007, on PBS's program Frontline, host Lyndon McIntyre asked a Muslim infiltrator, what causes a group of 18 Muslims to plot acts of terror? And the infiltrator said the wrong kind of influence at the wrong time in a young man's life. And McIntyre asked him, is it that fragile? Is that all it takes? And the infiltrator said, yes. Well, eight chapters of my book expand on his answer by looking at very multiple interacting psychological, sociological, systemic factors, um, beginning with, I think, evolutionary theory, which uh, long before dogmatists take their first breath or exhale their last, I think that evolutionary whisperings for dominance and aggression play a role. Um, these were adaptive traits, as you know, of the Stone Age, and th they linger in modern brains, some partying a little longer than they should. Um, so today, we see the, you know, the, the primate chest thump, and uh, it's moved to the table. Have you ever seen people you know, talk like this? And spears have been replaced with verbal weaponry. Um, we see that in adversarial politics some cases corporate boardrooms, and also from an evolutionary perspective, there's a new theory out called the argumentative theory of reasoning. And it's interesting, you know, they state that um, the real purpose of reasoning is to argue and convince others to agree with us in order to enhance our status and our dominance. Wow. Now, if we're all inclined to do that, Think of how much a dogmatic person is inclined to argue for those reasons. And against this backdrop of evolutionary whisperings, cultural adaptations, I think dogmatism is developmentally rooted in children who are born with a biological predisposition for chronic anxiety. And if these children who are genetically vulnerable, biologically vulnerable, mixture of both, if they're raised by authoritarian parents, who fail to promote emotion regulation and secure attachment, they learn that it isn't safe to think for themselves. It's interesting, Bruce Lipton is a, a cell biologist, and he claims that adoption of parental beliefs in childhood is natural since delta and theta waves, the slower brain waves, they predominate in childhood, early childhood, and up to the end of childhood, early adolescence. It's only in adolescence, later adolescence, that the, the beta, you know, the dense short waves, are more, I wouldn't say predominant necessarily, it depends on the situation, but they start playing an active role in the individual's ability to think analytically. And so <clears throat> it's natural that um, children who are, are vulnerable because of their brainwave development, to uh, believing what their parents say, it's na that's natural. It, th their brain has actually been washed. It's, been be it's being prepared to be brainwashed if their parents are authoritarian. And it is difficult for them to get over that. You may have heard in Dawkins' book, I think it's The God Delusion, where he says, 
he writes, that child is not a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian. That child is the child of parents who are Jews, Muslims, or Christians. But he doesn't offer any background into the biological underpinnings of that, which I think Bruce Lipton does an excellent job in the biology of belief is the name of his book. Well, if you add to those circumstances, so that, that leads to rigid internalization of dysfunctional closed-minded beliefs. If you add to that um, inadequate educational opportunities and resources that would other, otherwise perhaps compensate for those early deficiencies, um, and if these children live amidst political, economic, and social instability, or worse yet, if they're prolonged to humiliation, that prevents dignity, um, we now have an entire population of young adults who are largely defenseless against militarization, radicalization, and um, indoctrination. Gerald Post and Walter Reich are two writers in the field of terrorism, and um, both indicate that the best predictor of aggression is protracted humiliation. Altemeyer claims it's fear and self-righteousness, and those two overcome the normal inhibitions against hurting others. So theoretically, then, these are the conditions that create a pressure cooker for dogmatism that scar the face of reason. Yet I'm all but certain that if we confront dogmatism from wide angles, we can soften its bark to a faint whimper. And I wish you all the best in your work toward that goal. Thank you very much.